this video, we will be discussing the life and career of one Jeff Lynn, the frontman of the seminal 70s and 80s rock outfit, Electric Light Orchestra, as well as a producer of many, many great artists, including the Beatles, Tom Petty, and the Traveling Wilburys. And the more I think about Jeff Lynn and his music, the more I can't get it out of my head. Jeffrey Lynn was born December 30th, 1947 in Erdington, Birmingham, England. An appreciator of music himself, his father bought him his first instrument, a cheap Spanish-style guitar that cost two pounds, or like two dollars, an instrument which he still writes songs on to this very day. Jeff's first band was a group he put together with two of his childhood friends in 1963, and they were called the Handicaps, which was changed from Handicaps with an H, a name which, even in the early 60s, was too problematic. So they changed it. And after playing with them for a bit, he formed another group called the Chads, a name which I find hysterical. And in 1965, he acquired a Bang & Olufsen Baocord 2000 Deluxe reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, which he used as a multi-track recording device. He describes this little tape machine as his, quote, first studio. And with this little tape recorder, Jeff Lynne was able to learn the basics of recording production. In 1966, Lynne was invited to join a well-known Birmingham group called The Idle Race, a band previously fronted by one of Jeff's future bandmates and collaborators, Roy Wood. And by any measure, The Idle Race was a very popular band, especially in Northern England. Once, while recording at London's famous Abbey Road Studios, the band was asked if they would like to sit and watch a Beatles recording session that was happening right down the hall. Jeff remarked later that he was so excited from this experience that he couldn't sleep for days afterwards. But I get it. If that were me, I would feel the exact same way. So don't sweat it, Jeff. He continued to perform as the front man for the idol race until 1970, when fellow Birmingham rocker, or to put it a very British way, Brummy Roy Wood asked him to join his new project, his very popular, hard-rocking, psychedelic, proto-glam band, The Move. And this is a very important moment for Jeff, because not only was The Move very well known, but this band was about to transform into the vehicle for his success later on. Roy Wood had the idea to take the band into a new direction, and he wanted Jeff Lynne to help him do it. The idea was to take elements of classical music and experimental music and combine it with rock and roll and pop music. Up until this point, the move had been primarily like a hard rock band, so they had a lot of low end, a lot of heavy drum parts. But Roy had this idea to add strings and brass and orchestral arrangements to a traditional rock and roll setup. To usher in this new direction that the band was taking, they decided to actually change the name altogether. And at this point, the move becomes Electric Light Orchestra. They shared the frontman duties, each one taking turns singing their own songs. And if you listen to these albums, you can definitely hear a difference between the two different songwriting styles. Jeff Lynn certainly has more of a pop sensibility. I think he's a big Beatles fan, so he naturally wants to move in that direction. Roy Wood is also a great pop songwriter. However, he has this idea of making this a more experimental band. So he's attempting 
in his own way to push the music towards being more experimental, uh, adding elements of classical music, adding elements of Indian music, and you can hear how he just wants to take the sound way far out there. This leads inevitably to a clash between the two frontmen. Roy Wood has his ideas about the way he wants the band to go, and Jeff Lynne has his ideas as well. And eventually, Roy Wood says, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore, actually. I, I did these two albums, I'm going to go off and I'm going to form my own band. So he leaves the band in 1972 to form another group called Wizard, which is aptly named, in my opinion, because at the time, Roy Wood truly did look like a wizard. He had a, he had a long white beard, and he had that kind of magical, psychedelic gleam that people often get after they've taken way too many drugs. So yes, he definitely does look like the glam version of Merlin or Gandalf or something like that. And it's at this point, after the first two albums, after Roy Wood leaves, that Electric Light Orchestra starts to change into what it will eventually become. Basically, a juggernaut of pop hits. And I think this is probably a good moment in this story to talk about what was going on in music and in England at that time, because ELO was not the only band that was doing this classical rock and roll mashup. There were lots of bands doing it, maybe in a different way, but definitely lots of bands had this idea. It was called progressive rock or prog rock for short. And bands like Emerson, Lake and Palmer, Early Genesis, and Yes, and King Crimson. These were bands that were taking intellectual music, like jazz and classical, and they were doing it in a rock style and doing it in front of stadiums of people. And a lot of the titles of the songs even included words like opus and overture and movement number seven, words typically used to describe classical pieces. And even though a lot of people disagree about whether or not Electric Light Orchestra was part of this group of bands, they were definitely influenced by this and affected by it. And it changed the way their music sounded. And I think it's pretty interesting the way that Jeff Lynn takes ELO away from this space and steers it back towards something most people would consider just straight up pop music. Because I think for him, all of these songs by these progressive rock bands were basically adding all this extra complicated, intentionally complex arrangements around what a lot of times was a great pop song. In the middle of this cacophony of experimentalism was a two or three or four minute hit song, but it was the style of the time to not let that song stand on its own. You had to have a 10 minute interlude and a drum solo and a pipe organ and a 10 minute narration about the majesty of hobbits. But for a guy like Jeff Lynne, who loves the Beatles, who grew up listening to Roy Orbison and the Beach Boys, is that he wanted to get back to making straightforward pop songs that could be played on the radio and that you would want to put back on your record player and hum along to. So from this point on, Jeff Lynn keeps this concept of having strings and orchestral parts, but he switches it. Instead of using them to make avant-garde experimental arrangements, what he does is he uses them in service of these huge, lush pop symphonies. And that is the sound that will make Jeff Lynne basically a legend for decades to come. So now we're entering in to the golden era of ELO. You've got On the Third Day in 1973, 
El Dorado in 1974, which features Can't Get It Out of My Head, which is the song that this YouTube channel is named after. And you've got Face the Music in 1975. Each one of those records has the golden hits on it. Really great. If the band broke up after doing those records, that would be quite an accomplishment for any band of any genre. But it's the next two albums, New World Record and Out of the Blue, which just catapult the band to commercial success and I think artistic success. And if you put those records side by side, if you listen to them back to back, it almost sounds like it's part one and part two of the same record. And this is what they did. So just on those two albums, you have Living Thing, Do You, Telephone Line, Turn to Stone, Mr. Blue Sky, Street Talking Woman, and It's Over. On these two albums, they really reach the apex of their sound. This over-the-top, bombastic, big, lush, sweet, melodic, orchestral, choral, just amazing textures all over the place. The band follows up those two albums with a 1978 tour, which is the one that's got the famous spaceship, which is kind of the ELO logo. And they had this spaceship on stage and it opened up, I think like the band walked in and out of it, lasers, fog machines, you know, this is the late 70s. So this is stagecraft is going into hyperdrive. You've got Alice Cooper, you've got Kiss, you've got Bowie, you've got Peter Gabriel, you got all these people doing like Broadway level stage shows. And it's it's a miracle that any of them made any money during this period because I imagine that hauling all of this crazy circus around must have cost quite a bit. And they weren't charging like $500 a ticket like they are now for shows. And you know, this is kind of a silly side note, but this whole 70s stage show laser light kind of thing reminds me of an early 90s movie called The Stoned Age. One of the main characters is at a Blue Oyster Cult show and one of the lasers shines in his eye and he has this vision of a big eyeball floating in the air and it tells him that he needs to change his life. It's actually a very problematic movie, so trigger warning if you're going to watch it, but it is one of those kind of iconic 90s movies and it's got some really funny moments in it. Really encapsulates the era quite well. Anyway, so these two big albums are followed up by 1979's Discovery, which is pretty much described as the band's disco album. It's got Last Train to London, Shine a Little Love, which are like their big disco hits, but it's still got driving rock songs like Don't Bring Me Down. Bruce! So on the topic of disco, Jeff Lynn is quoted as saying, I love the force of disco. I love the freedom it gave me to make different rhythms across it. I enjoyed that really steady driving beat, just steady as a rock. I've always liked that simplicity in the bass drum. So basically the TLDR of that little quote is, I like the click track. And he loves to layer many, many different parts on top of each other through overdubs. But in order to do that, you've got to keep all of these parts synced together. And what better way to do that than with a click track? For those who don't know, a click track is just basically a steady beat that's going the whole time underneath the song. So a lot of disco songs have that click track because they're made with drum machines instead of real drums and But I think for Jeff Lynne, this was like a big innovation for him, and it enabled him to do more things by himself. And I think you can definitely hear that on 
the 80s ELO stuff. It really starts to get more synchronized. Those 80s albums have less swing and quote unquote feel to them. They're driving very exact. And it's a sound. Some people don't like it. I personally like it. I think it's great. I'm also someone that likes to record by myself. So I understand why guys like Jeff Lynne liked that technology. Speaking of the 80s, we have now arrived at that decade in our narrative timeline. In the 80s, is kind of a big sea change for Jeff because not only does he put out three great LPs, 1981's Time, 1983's Secret Messages, and 1986's Balance of Power, which I had on cassette for a really long road trip out west back in the day. And I must say that album really grew on me over the weeks and months that I listened to it in the car. Really great album. Uh, And so just like a lot of other artists of that time, a lot of these boomer artists, as they cross the threshold into the 80s, they scoop up all of this new technology that's coming out. So you got a lot of synthesizers, you got a lot of drum machines, uh, arpeggiators, um, things that, you know, bands like Devo and Prince and all kinds of artists were using to get new sounds onto their records. And Jeff Lynne seems to take to this like a duck to water. And also in this 80s decade, this period, he starts to really branch out as a producer and as a collaborator, as we'll get into quite a bit here. He starts working with George Harrison of the Beatles. He starts working with Tom Petty, Roy Orbison, the Traveling Wilburys, Del Shannon, Dave Edmonds, and a host of people that were basically his idols. Something that I think anybody would seek to do. And Jeff Lynne clearly enjoyed this period immensely. And we can't really begin to talk about Jeff Lynne in the 80s without talking about his relationship with George Harrison. Because in a lot of ways, the friendship that he starts up with George is a catalyst for him collaborating on all of these classic albums and with all of these really classic musicians. And as the story goes, the friendship started something like this. George hadn't put anything out in a while, I think, I don't know, off the top of my head, probably since the late 70s. It's a few years into the 80s. He's sitting around. He starts listening to some ELO records. And when he gets the idea to start recording new music, he thinks that, oh, hey, this guy, Jeff Lynn, that did this great band, I should hit him up to produce my new album. And so he does that. He hits him up. They go hang out together first. They go to a Formula One race. Um, I'm not sure exactly where it is. Maybe in England or France or Italy. or. But anyway, they have a great time together. They're hanging out. They're like best buds. Jeff Lynn is on cloud nine because he's hanging out with this hero. Fun fact, that is exactly what they call George's album that they start working on. And that album has some cool tracks on it. Uh, It's got the Got My Mind Set On You, which I remember when I was a kid watching it on MTV because there's a squirrel that plays a pipe like a saxophone, which always stuck with me. And now follow along with me for a second here, because that music video came out in 1987. And so did the movie Evil Dead, which features a very similar scene in which Bruce Campbell is sitting in a room surrounded by like demonically possessed inanimate objects that start coming to life and freaking him out. And in the George Harrison video, which I might add came out later that year, it's basically the same thing. George is sitting in a chair. 
And it's a happy song, so it's not like demonic, but all of the inanimate objects in the room start coming to life. Hey, maybe there's no connection there, but my conspiracy theory mind will always believe that there was a connection. Somebody had seen Evil Dead. Maybe. I don't know. Put your opinion about that in the comment section. I don't know. So anyway, they, do, they record this album together, and right after he works with George Harrison, he gives Roy Orbison a call on the phone and says, Hey, would you mind if I did some music with you? They get into the studio. They produce a bunch of amazing tracks, including You Got It, which song basically completely resuscitates Roy Orbison's like dead career. And then after that, he starts working with Tom Petty, who was also a friend of George Harrison. They put out an album called Full Moon Fever, which features Tom Petty's smash hit, Free Fallen, which is just a massive success for Tom Petty. And at this point, it's pretty safe to say that Jeff Lynne's kind of on a win streak here. And him and George Harrison have now just become fast friends. They're not even, they're not just like professional acquaintances. They're actually friends. They're hanging out all the time. <clears throat> so one day in particular, George Harrison hits him up, says, hey, I want to come over. Let's work on some songs. So Jeff Lynne says, okay. But George is like, hey, I got to hit up Tom Petty. My guitar is at his house because, you know, of course it is. So he goes over to Tom Petty's house to get the guitar. And he invites Tom Petty to come over to work on some songs. So he comes over. Then they get the idea to hit up Roy Orbison. He comes over. Then they call up Bob Dylan. And all of these guys are all sitting around together. The song that they do that day is Handle With Care, which would eventually become a hit for this band that doesn't exist yet called the Traveling Wilburys. So they record the song, Handle With Care. George keeps this tape with him. He brings it around, he's showing it to people. He thinks it's really great. He wants to do more of it. So then he decides, why don't we just record a whole album with the same dudes? And he hits them all back up and says, hey, do you guys want to keep doing this thing that we did that one day? They all say yes. And that is how the Traveling Wilburys was formed. But the thing that I find so amazing about this band is the fact that even though these guys are all super famous, they probably have huge egos, they're used to being in charge, but they're all just having fun playing music. And they didn't just do it once. They did one, two, three different Traveling Wilburys albums. Each one of those albums has some absolute smash hits on it. And as you're listening to it, you've got to give it up to Jeff Lynne because that's his sound. And that's not to say that George Harrison, Tom Petty, Roy Orbison, Bob Dylan are not all great artists in their own right. Of course they were. There's something about Jeff Lynne that just brings it all together and creates this timeless thing. So that basically gets us through the entire decade of the 80s. It's just like Jeff Lynne, he's throwing up threes, he's dunking, he's all over the court. He's just killing it. But I'm not even sure if all that success could have prepared him for what was about to happen next. Because his pal George calls him up and says, "Hey, how would you like to help me and the other remaining Beatles record new Beatles music? And of course, Jeff Lynne says yes. He probably had to throw up first, but then after he threw up, he said yes. And you might ask, well, how are they going to do this? Because in the early 90s, there's only three Beatles left. The fourth, John Lennon who is a pretty important part of that band, is no longer alive. Uh, he was assassinated in 1980 in front of his apartment building in New York City. But the way that they decide they're going to do this reunion is to take some demo tapes that I guess Yoko Ono gave them and said, hey, he did these songs, he didn't finish them, maybe you can do something with them. So they take the tapes, 
They go through them. They picked out three songs that they were going to work on. And each one of these three songs was set to be an addendum to the release of the three parts of the Beatles anthology. And for those of you who aren't aware, the Beatles anthology was basically like a three hour documentary about the career of the Beatles. I loved it when I was a kid. I was probably 10, 11 when that came out. It gets you kind of behind the scenes with the Beatles. It makes them look very cool. And if you're an 11 year old me, it makes you really, really want to be in a band. So each one of these parts of this Beatles anthology premiered on ABC in prime time. So I remember watching it with my family. We all sat on the couch like an old, like an old fashioned nuclear family and watched these parts. And so after the first part of the Beatles anthology, the song Free as a Bird comes out. Great track, loved it. The second anthology comes out a couple months later. Real Love is put out at the end of that. That one sounds cool. I, I really liked that one, even more than the first one. And so then my 11-year-old self waited and waited, and then the third part came out. And at the end of it, there was no song. And I remember at the time, I was like, hey, what the heck? I thought we were going to hear some new Beatles music, but it didn't happen. But as it turns out, there's a reason for that. So it was Free as a Bird, Real Love, and this song Now and Then, and then maybe another fourth one. But those are the ones that they really actually started recording and working on. So the first two they finished and they really liked. But when they started working on the third song, Now and Then, after the first day of doing it, George Harrison said, meh, I'm not a big fan. You can decide for yourself. Uh, feel free to check that out on YouTube. There's a lot of bootlegs of that song. Plus, there's even like fans who have hashed out what the parts would sound like or taken some AI. I'm not exactly sure how some of them were made, but it's pretty interesting. It's a great song, I think. It's not as much of like a quote unquote hit song. Uh, it's a little bit more mysterious and has kind of an ethereal, lonely quality to it, but I really like it. It would have been cool to hear them do it, but of course they didn't. So the story is that as the first two tracks came out, because these documentaries came out spaced months and months apart, maybe there was like a year or more between the first anthology and the last one, the music critics were not all very kind to the two songs free as a bird in real love they said this doesn't really this doesn't really sound like the beatles we wish it sounded more like the classic lineup but if you had been following along with jeff lynn's career up until those tracks came out you would have noticed they they sounded exactly like jeff lynn's style so all of his 80s records the george record the tom record the Traveling Wilburys record, it sounds exactly like that style. So supposedly, because of all the criticism that the band was getting for the first two songs when they came out, they decided to not put out the third song or finish the third song. Now, I'm not sure how much of that had to do with the criticism or the fact that George Harrison just didn't want to do it, or maybe they were just, they're old guys, so maybe they were just, hey, we're old, we did the two. We just don't want to do the third one. I'm sure Jeff Lynn would have jumped at the chance to finish the third one either way, but you know, it never happened. And there's a, there's a couple interesting tidbits that I have uh, from those sessions, because as I mentioned before, Jeff Lynn started getting really into using the click track, which is just like the steady metronome beat underneath the songs when you're doing your recording. Well, the drummer for the Beatles, Ringo Starr, did not like the click track. And I guess him and Jeff would fight about the use of it. They also did an album together as well. 
I don't know if it was before or after the Beatles anthology, but they also did a whole album together. But they disagreed on this. And Ringo has a really funny quote because he says, I don't want to play with a click track. I am the click track. Or he actually said, I am the effing click track, which is A, hilarious, B, very Ringo, and C, true. But overall, I think that this whole episode of Lynn recording the Beatles for the Beatles anthology songs is a great bookend for this narrative about Jeff Lynn. And for that matter, for this YouTube video slash podcast. Because for me, it kind of breaks down like this. If the Beatles music was a vehicle, then Jeff Lynn is like a mechanic who fitted the vehicle with lasers and an anti-gravity drive and flew the vehicle out of the atmosphere into the far reaches of outer space. Because Jeff Lynne basically takes this concept of what music is and what a song is that was sort of crafted in the 60s by the Beatles and others, and he takes that formula and he makes it larger than life and allows it to transcend the original boundaries that were created by the concept itself. And hey, it's also just good music. So you should go listen to it. Uh, I really encourage you to check out all of his ELO catalog, the early stuff, the golden years, uh, the later stuff, all the collaborations. I can't include that music, obviously, on this video because of YouTube rules and licensing and monetization. But I really encourage everyone to just go out on the Internet, find this music, listen to it, enjoy it. And it is my hope as I'm sure it is Jeff Lynn's hope, that after you listen to this music, you'll say to yourself, I can't get it out of my head. <laughs>